All right, we're back. <laughs> that, was, that was rough. Uh, so I just learned a lesson in live stream that sometimes everything just blows up, uh, crashes and burns, and you just need to cut the stream. So that was a good lesson of humility for the Loopcast. Uh, Josh's energy in the studio was just much too powerful uh, for, for the, the tech to even handle. So uh, apologies to everyone uh, for that little mishap. But uh, we got a lot more to get back into here. So, but I did say the prayer to St. Michael, and as soon as that prayer was done, everything's working. So There you go. So we're back, St. Michael. Thank you for the little assist there. Um, so to recap kind of what we talked about before, so Logan is in Arizona working with the political team. Josh was giving advice on how to handle dumb arguments on Twitter. And, oh, interesting. First con confession tonight for OCIA or RCIA from Dom Higgy. We'll get to that in a second. But, uh, Josh, if you wanted to – this actually I think is, is relevant because I think this happens to a lot of people in their lives. Like they see dumb arguments taking place either with friends or their workplace or online, especially online. And it's almost nice to have a guide of like how to engage with trolls online. What would your advice be to someone? You see something, you're not sure whether to bite or not, like how to engage an argument in a meaningful yeah, way. Yeah, I mean part of it – you know, I work for Catholic Vote, and as my wife likes to say, I argue for a living. That's why she doesn't like getting in arguments with me. Um, but I guess when it comes down to it, I always try to think to myself, am I being, I, I try to think like St. Joseph, am I being productive in my use of time? So I want to be good for my employer, my audience, and, and, and just not waste time. And when I'm in, you know, do I need to engage in this argument or not? Or is it, or is it really just about blowing off steam and screaming into the ether and, you know, saying a bunch of stuff online? Or can I stop for a second and think, can I actually add anything to this debate? Can I contribute it in a meaningful way? And just to know that there's obviously a lot of people, it's called trolling. You know, they, they say things intentionally and, and provocatively just to get people upset. And I think of Mike Lewis, he's got the website where Peter is. We've been talking about him a few times <laughs> in the past. That guy's a troll. He's, he's a saying troll. stuff just to get people upset. And then there was that, was it Rich Rajo or something like that? Total Kevin troll. Lefty. Bigger troll, maybe. Total troll. He was just talking about the other day, like, why do we, it's so weird that we have all the crucifixes covered up for Holy Week, you know, like, what is going on with that? The Vatican II Church is done with this. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? Like, you're not even getting your you know, your, your Vatican II stuff, right? You know, and so at some point you just got to realize, am I really adding anything to this debate? You know, or can you just say, this is a little silly and I'm not going to waste my time. So when you're arguing with somebody, are they going to be operating? Are they going to argue back in good faith or not? If not, then really, is it worth your time? Uh, but, yeah, there's, you know, yeah. and, then, and secondly, you know, remember that when you're debating with somebody, oftentimes, the goal shouldn't necessarily be to keep arguing until you win them over. You may not win them over. You should faithfully represent what you believe, but then remember that your audience might not, not may not necessarily be the person you're discussing it with. It might be someone else who's coming along and watching what you're saying. And yeah, so you want to make sure point. you're being a good job of faithfully articulating what, you know, what your position is. Yeah. I think oftentimes it's the people that go kind of rabid and are just like furiously typing back at everyone that puts out. It's like, it honestly makes their argument less convincing to me because I'm like, you seem like a crazy person. Like, therefore, why would I trust what you have to say and whatever? And Mike Lewis is a good example of this. I was actually just telling my wife um, something he put out. It was um, about ad orientum versus facing people, which of course is just like the intra Catholic debates are so exhausting. But he's like, who even pretends like this is a better thing? You know, like who would want a priest to face away from you as opposed to facing to you? And I actually saw like a pretty good response to that there was a priest who responded back and said, well, I don't know if you know, but cathedrals like traditional Catholic churches are designed uh, to have the acoustics actually reach people while you're facing the altar. So like the priest is facing the altar, God, of course, during consecration, that's kind of the purpose. That's why churches are designed in a narrow way, facing the, the altar and that we're all facing um, God. But it, the acoustics, if you project correctly, will bounce off the wall, go up, and then actually come behind people. And as most people, I think, kind of jumping in these debates, it just really revealed to me how ignorant I think most people are of tradition, architecture, like all of the things that, you know, you're supposed to expert on. And so all it takes is one troll to like 
throw out a dumb opinion that just fires everyone up but it's like did we did we did anyone learn anything here or like are the people speaking the people that should be speaking on it i don't know all things kind of parse out um logan i'm sure you've kind yeah. of you've probably dealt with your fair share of trolls in your day right yeah i mean my first rule is just don't engage whenever someone's trolling me online <laughs> it's like just don't engage don't don't feed into the trolls but i think it's something you have to learn working in politics and i think it's a good life lesson to know what hills are worth dying on and which ones should you just let go yeah actually i was in a conversation on twitter with uh my friend uh matt burke i say friend jokingly but he was on the loop cast so we big shout out to the super bowl friend. champ and and somebody said god is for the weak and i'm like yeah and i'm glad he's for the weak uh, i mean that's good i'm weak i need him praise god you know so like sometimes you can get under the skin of the trolls too it's kind of funny he didn't have a response to that so that's pretty fun yeah uh and the, and i did want to talk about this so dom higgy uh previously uh, revealed that he is uh going through rcia going to be received in the church on easter congratulations it's gonna be awesome uh, but this is good holy week talk so first confession tonight for rcia asked if he has any advice. Do you have anything that you would give to someone in this situation? The biggest advice I would have was just to realize every priest has heard just about every sin you could think of. It would be really unique for you to say something. I mean, just imagine this. Like, you're going to actually say something that's never been done before? I mean, like the first family that we ever had, Adam and Eve, they had sons and one murdered the other son. So, I mean, like as far as there's nothing new under the sun, I can't imagine you would say some sin and the priest would go, oh my goodness, I've never heard that before. I got to write this down. First, they, they don't. They don't honestly care about what the sin is. They just want you to be healed. They, they, they don't remember. Remember, we're talking about men here. We don't remember anything. So don't worry about that. He's just there to try to bring God's grace and healing to you. And so just to be comforted in that. And the thing is, everyone says this, when you get out of confession, you just feel so much better. And the devil is trying to, you know, all the demons are just trying to convince you to be very anxious and to be very nervous and to be, you know, have your brain going a mile a minute. Like, oh, what's the priest gonna say? What about this? Oh, should I say that? Should I give details or whatever? You know, it's gonna be fine. It is gonna be fine. You know, the devil, the last thing the devil wants is for you to walk in there and just to say what is on your mind and to, and to recount your sins. He wants you to feel guilty and horrible so that you don't go into confession. And uh, he hates the confessional more than anything else. Just remember that. So just go there. Don't have any sweat. Don't have any worry. You're, you know, uh, we've all had some major sins. I've got a, a lot of, a lot uh, of them. So well, <laughs> just Logan, don't worry Logan, about it. Logan's never had to go to confession, so... I mean, with a face like this, come on. <laughs> innocence, pure um, innocence. No, I mean, I think it's good to remember something I always tell myself is priests are just another broken vessel for a beautiful mercy. Um, and so when you go, just know you're talking to somebody else who struggles with the same things we struggle with. They're human beings. Um, and so we're kind of all in this in this struggle together. Yeah, I think the, the thing that I would maybe add is uh, because maybe I'm just beyond the fear. I've gone to confession so many times. I'm beyond kind of the fear element. I think Mercer's advice is good for sure. But I just think like it's so important to have a true sincerity, uh, a true repentance and like working even in the line to confession or before you go to confession, like just getting yourself in the state of just like sincerely willing uh, forgiveness for your sins and understanding that you need God's mercy and just to go in there with a very contrite, sincere heart, because that always makes me leave feeling the best. After feeling like I put it all on the table, I went through all of the correct steps, and then uh, you know you hear the words of absolution, and then you feel amazing. Like I, I, someone always jokes, like, "Oh, I hope that I get struck by lightning when I touch the doorknob to leave the confessional." You know, you go straight to heaven. It's kind of that feeling. And um, it's also yeah, just a good good point, sir, Tom. The only thing I would add to it would be. If, if in life in general, the way you look at other people who maybe cut you off in traffic or, you know, say something mean to you or rude, or, or if you just had an attitude of there, but for the grace of God, go I, and, and truly be humble. That's your, that, that's the one thing. If you think of there was the one, uh, I think it was St. Moses of, of the, one of the desert fathers uh, of Egypt. And he said, 
you know, you try to fast, but the devil doesn't eat. You know, you try to be, you know, stronger and, you know, I mean, demons have Im immense power. But yeah. the fact is, the one thing you do that the devils and the demons can't do is humility. And that makes the devil just, he absolutely detests that humility. And that is the one power that you have just to be truly devoid of yourself as much as you can. And that's that's a ticket to heaven right there. St. Moses the Black, I believe. One that's, of, one it. Of the that's it. That's yeah. it, yeah. An interesting, interesting point from Colleen. She says, St. Faustina is said to pray for the priest before your confession, which, interesting, I didn't think about that. But one thing I always think of, because I've been in places where, and Josh and I have opined about this before, where confession is just limited to, like, half hour on a Saturday and in a time that doesn't work for anyone. And a major reason why I'm Catholic and able to sustain living a Catholic lifestyle is the, the sacrament of confession and how much power priests have to absolve sins by making themselves available and encouraging frequent use of the sacrament is a complete game changer for, for faith communities. And to that point that Colleen made, it must be really taxing on priests that make themselves available constantly to hear people's sins, to hear about the worst of humanity all the time. It reminds me of kind of like a, if you had to work like a bouncer job at a bar or something and you just well, always had to kick out drunks. It's like you, you just see the worst of the worst all the time. But on the flip side, you know, for a priest, you get to you get to absolve people to have that power. So I think yeah. a great reminder to always be praying for these priests because they do have to hear they have to, it, it's exhausting. You have to hear about all these sins, but it, it's such a beautiful and important part of like a Catholic lifestyle. So I will always, always, always um, commend priests that are making themselves constantly available. Churches that make that a priority. I think it really is. And to important. preach about it. Totally. To preach about it, it. It's not talked about enough. I think you kind of get the uh, prosperity gospel a little bit too much, especially when it comes to like Protestant I don't churches, know but even at Catholic churches. Yeah. Um, confession's huge. Church of Nice is a bigger problem in our, our, our church than the uh, Prosperity, Prosperity Gospel, Gospel. I, know yeah. church, I think I meant Church of Nice. Good call on that one. Um, so, yeah, we briefly touched on Planet Fitness uh, <laughs> before everything crashed and burned. Uh, Logan canceled her membership. I think for people that are not... And apparently Planet on, Fitness canceled our <laughs> live stream. <laughs> yeah, right. Planet Fitness was mad. Um, so, Logan, just for people that weren't hanging out on the live, uh, just so we get it out to everyone, what's going on uh, with Planet Fitness? Why would you cancel your membership? Oh, so it just kicked me off and brought me back on. So we are not completely in the clear with the tech issues, but with Planet Fitness. So, okay. I, I loved my membership at Planet Fitness because I travel a ton for work. And so I was able to use it wherever I went, which was super convenient, but I canceled my membership last week because Planet Fitness has decided to join all the other woke organizations and corporations. And you know what they say, like I said earlier, the, the cliche, once you go woke, then you go broke. I mean, it's true for Planet Fitness. They decided that they were going to allow men to go into women's locker rooms and then punish anyone who stood up against it, which I think we've heard this song and dance before. Um, but unfortunately for Planet Fitness, fortunately for us, they've seen a massive, massive profit fall in a five day span. I think that we said it was over $400 million, nearly $500 million profit fall in five days. Um, absolutely insane. And the f craziest part is you look at this guy on the screen, it's a man. Like this isn't even like, he's not even disguising the fact that he's a man. And I think one thing that we've all been afraid of ever since Target started this whole bathroom thing. I don't know, Josh, what year was that? 2015, 2014? We've all had the fear that we're putting our daughters and, and women on the line. We're putting them at risk and we're seeing that continue to perpetuate. I mean, it's terrifying. So yeah, I canceled my membership happily. I marched on in there like a good little conservative and, and canceled it. <laughs> <laughs> so this, that means picture, I'm taking some rest days. I hate to say, and for, for people that haven't seen it, you can Google it or come over to the YouTube, uh, hop on the Loopcast YouTube, subscribe. We just hit 5,000 subscribers. Yeah. Thank you guys. It's so exciting. Um, but the guy's not trying. I mean, it's crazy. And and I talked about this earlier too. This woman took a picture of him. So this picture that we see here, because a 12 year old was uncomfortable in the women's bathroom. So he is doing this in front of a 12 year old in a women's bathroom at, at Planet Fitness. Her membership was canceled because she took this picture. So in the plan, Planned Parenthood Terms of Services, uh, I believe their statement is that people can use the restroom 
that aligns with their sincerely held gender identity, which of course, rife, rife for abuse. That, that's the most ridiculous legal talk ever. And then in their terms of service as well, I think taking a picture like in a bathroom is considered against their terms of service. So that came down on her, benefited this guy. And uh, I think $450 million market cap knocked off in like four days. And it really makes me happy to see like this is just the most common sense. I think it has a little bit of the Bud Light element where there's so many alternatives. Like Planet Fitness, Planet Fitness is nice because there's so many of them, but there's also plenty of other gyms you could go to. Like you could go to Crunch Fitness. 100%. You could go to Anytime Fitness. Like there's plenty of other options. And those places should welcome people canceling with open arms and not do stupid stuff with their policies like this, you know? So I agree. And I think conservatives are willing to pay more to not have to deal with this. I mean, I am 100% willing to pay more than $10 a month to know that I'm going to be able to go to the bathroom and not worry about a grown man being in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a small price to pay. I mean, it's absurd. So I've been meeting with legislators in a couple different states talking about legislation surrounding this issue and like how can you attack it from a legislative side on the state level. And one of the things that we've talked about is you know, how can we ensure that these organizations are held liable? So how can we make sure Planet Fitness is held liable if something happens to a girl in their bathrooms, thanks to them allowing grown men in there? Um, and so I think you're going to see a lot more states trying to find ways around th these issues and, and try to stand up for their people. Yeah, for sure. And I've just... We been... shouldn't have to wait till there's a court case or, or, or an assault. You know, it'd be nice to right. get laws passed where it's say, no, it's based on your biological sex at birth. Let's go. So I've just been told there's a Planet Fitness commercial that we need to watch by a producer here. Said it's pretty crazy. So uh, oh, if, boy. You guys, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to experience our tour with the locker rooms. After you. No, no. After you. Okay. <clears throat> oh. I had a tickle in my throat. I don't know which one you're supposed to use. Dum 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 cool. Wait, this is real? That was that that wasn't a scam. I think that's a parody. That has to be a parody. Come on now. I got played by the producers. There's no way that is real. Oh my gosh, I got completely played. Oh my gosh. All right. We got to. Well, <laughs> boys, no mercy <laughs> Monday. <laughs> you know, Jesus. all this talk of genders has me thinking that I need to leave the guys to have some, some guy time on the loop cast. Cause I have to go get to work. Go. So, Logan, Logan is way too important to the organization to be hanging out in the loop cast with us. Um, as much as I'd rather be here. I've seen, you know, people walk by that I need to go meet with. So I'm right. in a glass box right now and everyone can see me. <laughs> And so it's kind of awkward. So I do have to go talk to them. All right, Logan, thank you for hopping on for the Planet Fitness segment. Josh and I will soldier on. Yeah, hate to miss that. I know, us, but everyone's going to leave because they want Logan more than us. Yeah, so. That's true. That's true. Erica, you got to come back. Hold soon, on. Man. Just hold on. Gosh. All right. Bye, guys. All right. See you, Logan. <laughs> All right, Josh. So we're moving on now. Uh, where where should we dive off into? We have a couple I want to jump into this Carvel stuff. I think it's amazing. <laughs> okay, go for it. Well, um, you know, a lot, you know, this is probably too, I don't know if you remember James Carville, probably too, uh, too old school for you, uh, but James Carville is a veteran Democratic consultant. He was instrumental to Bill Clinton's election victory in 1992. He was the one that famously said, it's the economy stupid when talking about the race in 1992. And now he's on a kind of a war path of his own right now. He was blaming President Joe Biden's low approval ratings on the party having too many preachy females. And he said, he said he was looking at, you know, Joe Biden's approval ratings at 37 percent. He said the abysmal polling numbers, looking at the at these horrible uh, poll numbers, is like walking in on your grandma naked. <laughs> <laughs> The raging cage and James Carville has a way of saying things. Let me tell you what. Uh, but he said that. The, the, surprise, surprise. Yeah, he said uh, the party's feminine voice is way too woke. And the, he said, quote, the woke stuff is killing us. He goes, a, a suspicion of mine is that there are too many preachy females, he said. 
and, and their message is don't drink beer, don't watch football, don't eat hamburgers. This is not good for you. The message is too feminine. Everything you're doing is destroying the planet. You've got to eat your peas. And Carvel saying that this message is disastrous. Not only, I mean, white men have sort of left the Democratic Party, you know, a long time ago. There's still obviously some white men that vote for Democrats, obviously. But the problem is it's now that uh, black men are leaving the Democratic Party. Either they're going to stay home or they're going to vote for Trump. And so Carvel's desperately worried about this, that members of his party uh, are going to, his party's going to lose the election because uh, the, the Democratic Party is way too progressive left, feminist, anti-man, anti-enjoying anything, football, so, beer, whatever. So can I, and I think there's a lot of wisdom there, but can I ask you this question then? It seems like, how do I want to phrase this? What won Joe Biden the election in 2020 was white female suburban voters, correct? That's true. So... If that's the case, and it won him in 2020, is it a strategic play to be, you know, going all in on abortion, going all in on climate change, going all in on what's clearly white suburban women care about uh, the most? Is it an intentional play, or has it just been kind of something that the left has just succumbed to the extremes? So, like the AOCs or or the Ilan Omars, like the people on the far far left, are just so sensational that they just kind of get sucked a little bit towards that side. What do you think? So if you look at the last few election cycles, you know, 2016, 2020, and then now this 2024 presidential campaign. So we're seeing a realignment going on in politics. And so Donald Trump was able to get a lot of working class, blue collar, white voters to vote for him in 2016. And he still held on to a, enough of the suburban, white suburban voters to get elected president. But in 2020, you're right. He lost a lot of the white suburban, especially women voters, uh, enough of them, and that Biden was able to get elected. Now, people say, well, the election was stolen, shenanigans. There were shenanigans in 2016, too, by the way. And there were going to be shenanigans in 2024. I do think voting by mail was a bad idea, and it, it probably cost us more uh, in 2020. For sure. So it may have been the difference. But in 2016, Donald Trump won over a lot of white, uh, blue-collar Democrats. He kept them in 2020, but he lost these white suburban women a lot. And in 2024, he's still not doing a great job with these suburban women, but he's now picking up more uh, Hispanic and black men to his coalition. So at, right now, he's leading in the polls by about three or four points nationwide, in addition to leading by five points in several states like Michigan, Arizona, Pennsylvania. If the election were held today, Donald Trump would win, even still not doing so great amongst these white suburban women. And the point that James Carville is trying to make is if you double down too hard on this white suburban message, you're causing these black men and Hispanic men to say, forget this. This party just doesn't stand for me. I'm going to become a Republican or stay home. Either way, it's going to be disastrous for Biden. I have to say, it feels like the white men demographic are even kind of lost by that, too, by the preachy, pitchy, screaming <laughs> everything you well, know what i mean like it's just it's such of a course they are that but white like men white men is a demographic that have voted republican for how many decades or generations now so it, I, it, there's no difference really can i ask you then when did they lose the women you know if you think well, white men were voted this way for so long why did all of a sudden their wives start voting the other way well, it, there's always been a bit of a gender gap but when we talk about the gender gap it's important to realize that married women vote republican it's unmarried women that vote Democratic. And of course, and we've talked about this before, that people are getting married at later dates. And so the number of people proportionally who are unmarried is higher now. And so the number of unmarried women that are part of the electorate is a higher number, and they're overwhelmingly voting Democrat. So, you know, it's true that if we could encourage more family formation, then, you know, single women would become married women, and they tend to vote you know, I would say more conservatively, naturally. Yeah. So um, I'm not unbiased in that realm either. But, um, you know, the gender gap, as people have said, is really a marriage gap. And uh, single women vote overwhelmingly Democratic, but married women still favor the Republican Party. Yeah, and I've seen, I've seen it even flip where young unmarried women start off 
uh, as Democrats. And then basically as soon as they get married, within the next couple of years, their I- ideology starts to shift a little bit. I mean, I'd imagine most of that because they have kids and now future responsibility, uh, maybe a closer in touch with like a masculine perspective. Um, I don't know. It, it Possibly. I mean, it's Kelly and Conway used to talk about the M's. You know, they, they have a mortgage. They have munchkins. You know, there's reasons why <laughs> they tend to start drifting a little bit to the right on voting stuff. So we'll see. I have not heard the M's, although we did go kind of hard on Kelly and Conway for her pro-life statements, which is fair. Um, yeah. So I, this is my Twilight Zone. I want to play it early because I think there's a lot of meat here. So if we could pull this up. So there's a, a show on Netflix. I guess it's based on a book. I actually just talked to someone who was pretty familiar with it. I think I'd read it. It's called The Three-Body Problem. It's a sci-fi novel, and there's a scene that was just going crazy. I Every time I see it, it always shocks me because you hear communism, and you kind of think of your harmless, nutty professor at some liberal institution they don't have much pull. Obviously, we see a lot of uh, elements of this, unfortunately, kind of creeping in society. That's a constant topic. But there's a, as a part of this series, there is a real live uh, struggle session. And uh, if we could just play, if we could play it with no volume, if that'd be possible, because I think the visuals just absolutely like knocked me off my seat. I just had to look in to see what all this was about. Basically, in the book, it is a wife and husband. Uh, the wife tells on the husband because the husband is a physics professor and he was teaching uh, basic physics concepts and that was enough to get him in trouble with the state because the state, uh, it wasn't a state approved science to be taught. And so what they did was they brought him in front of a crowd of people chanting and uh, the wife was up there pointing at him. He had to wear like a dunce cap basically and they beat him to death. Uh, if I, I'm not seeing it, I think Jessica, I see. And uh, yeah, the rest is very graphic because they kill him on the stage. But someone someone tweeted about it, Ew. and the, the the tweet was, <laughs> "What did y'all think communism meant? Vibes, papers, essays?" And it always just it always reminds me of how many lives were taken by communism in brutal, revolutionary, ruthless fashion, and. The even it was it was in Chinese dub, but the the uh, slogans reminded me so much of like slogans that we've just heard over the last couple of years. So like Black Lives Matter or trust the science or, you know, wh- whatever phrase just gets repeated over and over again, because, of course, that means you're devoid of actually nuance or thinking. It's just basically to get rile, pe- rile people up. And um, yeah, seeing that it, just was like scary. But it's interesting, though. I mean. You know, the, you, you know, we hear so much in TVs and in, in, in movies about the Holocaust, which was horrifying. You know, six million Jews that were killed by the Nazis. But why don't we hear about the millions of people that were killed in China? Why don't we hear about the millions that were killed in Soviet Russia? You know, the, the so many people were killed in Cambodia. You know, all these different communist revolutionaries, you know, places. And it's really, you know, the, the Nazis... That gets a lot of attention, but you never hear it about. I'm glad to see that there's some movie now you're saying. This was on Netflix. This, this is crazy amazing. that this is out on a mainstream because it's so rare to see this in mainstream form because China actually has such a large influence. Remember China like made John Cena apologize for saying that oh, Taiwan was a country? Absolutely. Like, they are dominant over what messages get out because they hold so much power. But yeah, this came out and it really stirred a lot of people up because it was just shocking to see. This was a reality of what happened in China. 
throughout the 1900s. Even uh, I remember talking to um, he's still in jail. Um, uh, what was, do you remember his name, Josh? He's uh, I did the interview. Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai's still in jail right now uh, because he had a pro. So it was anti CCP newspaper in Hong Kong. And he's in jail on these drummed up charges that are total nonsense. And he grew up uh, during the communist revolution in China and his family lived in like a middle class house. And then all of a sudden that was just seized and then they could pay rent on it for a little bit. And then they were just kicked out completely. And he escapes to Hong Kong to like live a, uh, a better life. Basically his parents just sent him on a boat with a coin in his, in his underwear to, and of course the coin got stolen, but he ended up in Hong Kong with nothing. And to, to read through like what Fulton Sheen had to say about communism and John Paul II had to say about communism, it, it, it almost like it loses its value a little bit because I think it gets talked about so much and we don't see things like this. Like it's, when you see it visually like this, you're like, whoa, this is kind of scary. Um, it, it, it brings it, it to feels life. real, totally. It makes it feel so real. So like, I don't know. It's hard not to connect this to a lot of things that I've kind of seen in regards to like 2020, like what we got with rioting there, what we're getting with like DEI in schools. Like it all feels very like early stages of a lot of this kind of thing. Um, so I was just, the twilight zone was that this was put out in any mainstream media period. Um, <laughs> so I thought I'd get in early on that one. No, I thought it was good. And, and you know, you're right though. Like with John Cena, a lot of these actors, and movie studios are afraid to take on China, so that Netflix put this out was really actually courageous. Uh, you know, the, I'm not saying they're virtuous and a lot of they put out a lot of stuff that's garbage and and awful and morally repugnant. But that they did this right, I will give them props for it. Um, <laughs> it I mean, it, it is true though. There are a lot of companies, business companies or whatever, that are more than willing to bend over backwards and do but be unspeakable because they want to keep the Chinese market on their side. So, yeah. Uh, and then also happy Holy week, everyone. I saw uh shout out Mitch. You threw that up right away. Happy Holy week, a uh, big week for Catholics, obviously. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to interact with the chat a little bit. I was talking to my mom over the weekend and I have a young son and thinking about just how important Easter is liturgically. Actually, it's the most important uh, for Catholics. And the celebration that it gets met with often is just very like dumb and secular, like Easter eggs and bunnies. And it, it has nothing to do with Catholicism really. And I was just thinking about ways to kind of instill as, as my kid gets older, what Easter really means in children. And I was wondering if there's any tradition. Easter eggs are Catholic though. Oh, bang. Okay. So first off, anyone in the chat right now, if you have any uh, liturgical Easter traditions that you do, uh, send it out there. I've just been trying to mull on ways to make the this week really special, especially now as I have children. Uh, but Josh, what were you saying about Easter eggs? And then if you have anything you guys do to make Holy Week uh, extra holy? Yeah, so I mean, it used to be that the Lent and fast, people wouldn't even eat eggs. So that's why they have an abundance of eggs left over by the time, you know, the 46 days of Lent are over. And so they, you know, it became a tradition. There was also the story about Mary Magdalene and the egg. Um, I, my name, the, the, the exact part of the story is it, failing me now, but like she touched the egg and it turned red. It was so, I mean, it's just, there's a lot of cool stories out that's there cool. um, about that. So um, in terms of what we do for it, we have, um, we, we do a, the biggest thing for our kids, I, I my wife found this maybe 15 years ago, uh, one of these mommy blogger sites where we have like a Good Friday meal at lunchtime, which is very small, obviously, but we have pretzels representing like the crown of thorns. And we have all, you know, um, all of representing the, uh, all the different parts of it. I'm forgetting now everything in it, but um, I can tell you, my kids never forget this because they're always like, we got to do the Good Friday meal. We got to do the Good Friday meal. So, um, and we bring out the Bible and there's the scripture readings for it all. And our kids get very excited by it. So that's awesome. I'll have to, I'll have to track that down. She's big on that. I, you know, it's, it's just a neat way for kids, for our kids to realize, uh, have you, you know, have, 
Have you ever done a Seder meal, Josh? Um, once I think. Okay, I think my mom did that one time. We had lamb. <laughs> I distinctly remember that. We tried it out one year. We did lamb. Uh, so we got a few rolling in here. I think are definitely worth shouting out. So uh, we have. Yeah, I thought somebody said they do the the Passion of the Christ. Watch it every year. That's yeah kind of intense. I, I mean, I end up only doing it, watching it about every five years because I I just don't want it, you know, to get numb to it. Um, I like Mel Gibson. I thought that was a fantastic movie. Um, my friend, my at the time, my my roommate went to go see it in the theater, and the guy next to him had a a bowl full of popcorn. <laughs> he just looked at him like, "Do you even know what mo movie you're watching?" Say the guy got a few bites out of it, and then he, he, he didn't need any uh, anything else for the rest of the uh, two hours. Dude, say Christ is Lord. Uh, if you're eating popcorn during the Passion, I don't know if you're actually human. You might be. I don't think you knew what was going on with it, so. Um, <laughs> You're in for that a was shot. a waste of seven bucks. <laughs> yeah, so we have uh, we have a few exciting firsts. Also, Easter Vigil is a big one. So we have a uh, shout out Mitch, a uh, newborn daughter, getting baptized on Easter. That's amazing. Uh, Ariel, first time hosting Easter for the family. Congratulations. That's cool. Uh, I, I know this guy, Josh Resnichek. What up, Josh? Uh, director of video here at Catholic Vote. Said he covers up statues in the house for Holy Week. I actually really like this idea because oh, nice. churches do it for the most part. If you go to a, a church most likely they cover them up our church was all covered up on sunday except um, for rich rothos church apparently <laughs> yeah apparently <laughs> <laughs> except for the trolls on twitter they took them down dude they want those statues out uh we got shout out another catholic vote employee barbara moore holy holy thursday do a foot washing with the family then a passover meal read the bible very nice uh yeah, we'll get into mitchell our favorite commenter he's we do empty tomb desserts the kids wrap a crescent roll around a marshmallow and bake it. The marshmallow melts, representing Christ is risen. Wow. I absolutely think that's super neat, but I hate marshmallow in just about every form. So I'll, I'm, sure, I'm sure my kids will love it, though. <laughs> you're, not a, you're not a peeps guy, Josh? I don't. Peeps are the worst. <laughs> Although I, I buy some just to put it in the microwave and watch them get to be the size of, like, a Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rex. You know, they get really huge. But I, marshmallow, yeah. I, actually, the only time I like marshmallow is... Rice Krispie treats, if they would have the peanut butter, then I like that. But Interesting. Then, other than that, I don't like marshmallow either. I think I think peeps are a psyop that everyone just pretended to like kind of, but no one actually does. Is there people actually like peeps out there? I don't I don't think it's possible. I mean, why would you eat that when you can have a Reese's Pieces egg? Exactly. Yeah, the, the Reese's is the play for sure in the egg form. Tastes actually Best good. Best sort ever. Uh, were you on the Prince of Egypt train? I definitely was. We've watched this many oh, yeah. times. We Prince love of that Egypt. Too, Sick, sure. dude. Soundtrack, unbelievable. So cool. Uh, okay, we got Home Parish, Hispanic Parish. Four men carry a statue of Christ's deceased body following the Good Friday liturgy and lay him in a makeshift tomb. Wow. By that is crazy. I've never that heard is, that. That is major awesome, Matthew. That's cool. Dude, shout out, Matthew. That is crazy. Um, Starburst jelly beans, the only Easter candy I like. That's Ariel. You know who loved uh, jelly beans a ton? Which president loved jelly beans the most? Uh, Reagan. I don't. That's it. Oh, let's go. Okay. One jelly, yeah, he, he got the jelly belly beans. He got them in. Yeah. <laughs> he said, Peeps stop tasting good when I turned seven. <laughs> <laughs> You're a legend. I used to like when I was a kid the Cadbury eggs, but now they're way. Too oh, sweet. I can't do. Oh, those are yeah, someone. That's another psyop. That's another psyop. No one likes. Actually, no. I'm gonna get pushback on that. I know people that do. Uh, but another thing too, uh, the Easter Vigil Mass. So when I was in college, this is kind of cool. Shout out to Ave Maria. Uh, we would do the Easter Vigil Mass, and then they would have like all the candles light up. And we had someone up in the balcony taking a picture, so you just see like all the candles kind of like slowly light up. Is really cool. And then afterwards, there was a household, which is like kind of our, I guess, Catholic version of fraternities. They would put on a resurrection party right after. So we would get out of the vigil mass, roll over to the cafeteria, and they had like Chick-fil-A, a DJ. They had lights going. It was it was pretty awesome. I'll never. Chick-fil-A because it was still Saturday. Right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to get anyone in trouble here, but. Uh, Chick Fil A. Well, it was past midnight, so it was Sunday. Oh, the well then, yeah, it was a midnight. Sunday, they're, not, they're not open on Sundays, Chick Fil A. Oh yeah, we got them catered like Saturday night. We must have got them in. Before. Uh, I don't know how they pulled it off. Big brain. Shout out to. <laughs> shout out to. What it, was that? 
Fishers of oh, Caramel oh, Cadbury eggs? Why don't I know about this? Brad. <laughs> you know, though, when a kids eat the uh, the jelly beans, they, they pretty much all give the, the black jelly beans to me because they hate black licorice, except for my yeah. son, Charlie. He likes it, but I love the black, black licorice, dude. Yeah, I don't like jelly beans. I think I was kind of ruined because did you ever have... It matched my soul, so it works out good. Did you ever have those bean boozles, you know what I'm talking about, where they'll have some taste really good and then some will taste like a fart? You know what I'm talking about? No, I have no idea, but what, what is this good morning from Bismarck? I'm wearing my You Mary shirt for... for uh, look at that. Hey, would you like that? I'm going to be heading to Bismarck uh, next month. Go check out the You Mary campus with my daughter. She's probably going to enroll there. So shout out you, Mary. Good school. Good school. I got two other of my friends. Their kids are probably going to be going to you, Mary, too. So I thought I'd represent with the shirt. You, Mary, kind of the move. Uh, (laughs) Love the user measure, the one mass that is so long. You can eat a Snickers bar at the Gloria and still be good for Eucharistic fast. (laughs) Oh, Matthew. The chat. No, no. The chat is on fire today. (laughs) Terrible. It does remind okay, me, though. So, I mean, there are people who are, if we're going to talk about stuff, I mean, Pentecost, I know it's a few weeks later, but I remember I went to a, a charismatic church for Pentecost Sunday because apparently I hate myself. And these people <laughs> have good faith. They're good people. But, I mean, I think it was like three hours long. And, I, you know, come on. it's I'm a bad Catholic. I couldn't handle it. It was a revival. The vigil vigil's long. Actually, if we're getting into real personal stories, so I was an altar server growing up, and at our parish we had like 40 kids serve every Sunday. It was crazy. Shout out to uh, St. Cyril Methodius in Michigan. But one, because they're so long and there'd be incense, and it got really hot in the church because we were all in the in the get-ups and uh, ventilation was bad. So uh, people had that would hold the candles. We would all be holding the candles. And I remember just like looking over at this other kid kind of altar serving me and my friend were there and the kid kind of gives us a heads up like, Hey, I'm not, I'm not feeling too good. And he's like, Hey, do you need to go to the bathroom? So I was like, no, like, I think I can make it. I think I can make it. I can't remember. We were like an hour deep at this point. And then all of a sudden we just heard bam, like just heard a huge bang on a, and he totally passed out, hit his head on the, on the pew. And we had to like carry him out like a, like an angel or something like we just like carried him out in the robes all the way out to like go take him he was okay he was all good but that easter vigil mask can get uh pretty long and i'll never forget that kid oh, passing I said, out to carry him out no i'm kidding banging his head <laughs> no not exactly uh so josh do you have uh do you have anything for your twilight zone this week well my only twilight zone i guess with these you know the liberal fear online that MSNBC decided to hire former RNC chair, Ronna Romney McDaniel, to be a spokesperson, you know, like a, a TV talking head. And they just lost their minds. Like, how could you have a, a party flack now working there? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, Jen Psaki was working for the White, you know, the White House, and now she's at MSNBC, and you don't have a problem with that? What, what, what's the difference? And, of course, you have George Stephanopoulos who's been on ABC News forever. He was Clinton's main flack guy. So this idea that suddenly it's outrageous that someone would work for an official party organization and then be a part of the media, they're all so upset about this. And it's like, oh, it's because it's a Republican that you have a problem with. It's not that you have a problem with a, a party hack. So it well, just cracks me up. My favorite was that morning Joe was mad about it. He's like, we, she is not welcome on my show. I can't believe they would extend this or whatever. He's like the oh, king Oh, morning Joe. The Isn't he a former Republican congressman? Oh, gee. Wait, what? He was? Are you kidding me? You don't know this? <laughs> no. Morning Joe was a congressman? Joe Scarborough was a congressman from the Redneck Riviera, the Florida Panhandle, dude. Yeah, he was. And and the, the online you know conspiracy rumors is that one of his uh, employees on his uh, staff got murdered and people are blaming it on him. And it's like, that, there's a whole online conspiracy and that's how the deep state has the dirt on him or whatever. I'm not what? teaching that in any way, but like the online trolls are crazy about him. Yeah, no, but he was a congressman from Florida, fairly conservative. And then now he's with MSNBC and for the last 20 years has been a total left winger. Um, he's Josh, that's not common knowledge. I don't think most people, most people know him as the guy that Trump broke. Like he's, he sounds like a crazy person on MSNBC every morning. He was a representative. Someone said from Alabama, no, Brad, he was a uh, Florida panhandle. Uh, he was a congressman from uh, Florida panhandle. Yeah. Wow. I remember that. 
he was just to be a conservative. I mean, it's a very conservative district, very conservative area. Oh yeah, but, for uh, sure. Wow. Yeah, I'm surprised. <laughs> I mean, I'm a political nerd, so I know all this stuff. But I mean, this right. is true. This is true. He was uh, he was congressman from Florida's first district from 1995 to 2001. He left office September 5th, 2001, just a week before 9/11. Yeah. Do so. Let's let's go through it then. Do any other uh, political commentators have interesting pasts that we should know about? Like, do you know what was what was Tucker's deal? Because Tucker obviously has his own network now, but he never, his not network? that I, he never actually campaigned, for, you know, he never was a spokesman for any politician that I can think of, but, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon for these people to, to be on one side, you know, be like Jen Psaki was the press secretary for, oh, you know, for the sure. White House, and now she's on MSNBC. So these are very common. Didn't, didn't Whoopi Goldberg, was she, did she represent anyone? No, 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 dude. She was Hollywood all the way. She was no, an I'm actress, just kidding. obviously movies. I, I, yeah, come on. That was a total joke. I know that she was in Sister Act 1 and 2. Uh, that's where she got all her expertise about politics. So she hopped over to The View and loved to show Obviously, Cause, yeah. Because uh, Farrah, Alyssa Farrah Griffin was on Trump's team, right? She was actually uh, uh, for Vice President Mike Pence, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, that was it. Okay. Because I know they kind of pull people in. And then Rosie O'Donnell, famously on The View, right? <laughs> Trump, not a fan? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not a fan. No, no. But, um, well, Trump wasn't a fan of her. Famously. Right. No, exactly. <sighs> yeah. I had my only other potential Twilight Zone was the Trump legal woe saga. So, did you hear about Trump's potential way out of not being able to pay back the debt? Well, the, the, here, the thing is, he's apparently Truth Social finally went mm -hmm. through the merger or whatever. And now he's standing to win like this windfall, like four to five billion or something like that. It's like, 4.5 to $5 billion. So basically he's at the point now where Letizia James, the, uh, James, the attorney general of New York, uh, is trying to seize his assets. So I think either today or tomorrow, she potentially legally could because he has to pay back this $450 million in debt. And so she's trying to go after his golf course in upstate New York, uh, and a few other things. And he's really trying to avoid that happening. So he's trying to do a few things in the legal system. But his other strategy is to do a basically have it got really popular around like 2020, 2021, but a SPAC. So basically, it's another company merging with True Social to then take it public because it has the ability to do so. If he takes it public and it has a successful opening, he could come into about four, four or five billion dollars. So he would have way more money than he needs to pay this back. But man, I, just how. We're getting real creative with ways to have to pay back this amount of money. Um, well, Trump that, might just not pay it back and have her try to seize his property because I think it would be great TV and actually probably oh give him a bump in the polls. I was supposed to think about that. Yeah, I would not be surprised by that at all. Because I feel like the biggest... So I remember him and DeSantis were pretty much neck and neck in the beginning, and the biggest tide shift was when they raided Mar-a-Lago. Do you remember that? Yeah, it definitely made a difference in his campaign. It gave him a boost. Huge. Any chance that DeSantis had to make inroads were pretty much over by that point. Yeah, because it gave him kind of the uh, the persecuted narrative. It was like, hey, look, right. they literally are on my property, sho shoving around guns, all that. And so I just so, think this this I don't know if Josh, you got to tell me. Like, I need real answers on this. Are is there hope to truly just get him in jail? Is the only way to stop him from winning at this point? So they're just going all in on that strategy, even though it makes him look like a martyr and makes him look persecuted they're like the problem is i don't think the timeline's on their side i mean like uh they could seize these assets with the new york case and then the dc circuit court case is going up to the supreme court now and the court supreme court's gonna you know hear the case and then argue it and probably remand the court the, the case back to the dc circuit with instructions all the, unfortunately all this time frame for the democrats unfortunately is that they're not going to be able to get trump uh, from a legal standpoint until you know, he's on the other side of this election. It's just the timing isn't working out for them. And it does it does look like war, uh, law, uh, war, lawfare. Well, it is. Uh, it does look like they're trying to mobilize, you know, it, within Georgia, with what's going on in D.C., and then in New York. The New York case is the simplest one for people to understand. It's like, you know. There's no crime. Like, it, it, it's like, what? There's no crime. There's no, there's no one claiming that they got defrauded. There's no victims. And you're just thinking that, he, he assessed his property too high 
in order to get a loan, which he used to build a hotel building, and then he repaid his entire loan in full. So what's the crime exactly? There's, I mean, there is none. Is the and then did and you then, see what did you see what happened in Georgia? Well, there's so much going on with the Georgia case. Yeah, it's, it's so crazy. Quick synopsis, if I can, because it it was like the Maru show. Uh, Fannie Willis, Fannie Willis is the district attorney of a Fulton County, Georgia. She had a special agent prosecute. His name is Nathaniel Wade. Prosecute Trump, and she had been, she had a romantic relationship with him before all this happened, and so they brought her on the stage. Uh, so like obvious ethics concerns there, right? And so they brought her up. She didn't even, her lawyer was begging her not to testify. She testifies anyway, basically admits to campaign finance fraud in like three different ways, uh, admits to this inappropriate relationship with this guy. And so after all this goes down, the judge made the decision to only remove uh, this guy, Wade, from the case, left Fannie Which they Willis had on. to do it at a minute. They 100% had to do it, but they could have also taken Fannie Willis off the case, and and they did. I, I kind of think it helps Trump that she's being on it because she's so exactly complex. like it's really. I mean, all the clips are out there. It's shocking that this person is anywhere near power. Um, I think she had a an interview clip when she was running for the position. She said, uh, "Fulton County deserves someone that is not going to sleep with subordinates or steal money from the taxpayers." And she literally just admitted to doing both on, <laughs> during the testimony. You're like, "Oh my gosh!" Like these are the people going after Trump. It is just. But so, like, crazy. it was this guy Noah Rothman. He's a kind of conservative-ish, uh, but he's a never Trumper type. And when the and when the story broke about Truth Social merging and getting approved in time so that he'll get this payout of like five billion dollars or whatever it is and noah rothman's just like shaking his head at trump because someone who he's had problems with as because he's never trumper he's like man this he's the luckiest guy alive <laughs> it's like it is true he's like that teflon don like they keep trying to get him and he it's like you know and, and the, the never trumpers just say he's the dumbest guy in the world but then is he really just pure luck and really dumb or is he maybe he knows what he's doing so it's interesting who knows but uh, yeah i think that, that that puts us at a little bit of a wrap here love seeing so many people in the live stream it's so fun interacting with you guys definitely going to be bringing more questions forward so on a housekeeping note we are not going to be recording on good friday for sure for obvious reasons uh, we hope you all are are, are praying and, and taking that time uh, to practice your faith and celebrate your faith so uh, what's going on is we're going to record again on Wednesday uh, and then uh, enjoy Easter. We'll see about Monday. I, I haven't talked to people about what's going on on Monday yet, but we'll we'll let you guys know either way on Wednesday. It's Monday, but. <laughs> but for sure, no show on Friday. Uh, just ask that uh, you pray for us. We'll be praying for you. Uh, have a wonderful Holy Week, guys, um, and we'll see you on the next show on Wednesday. Uh, pray St. Thomas More, St. Fidelis, Our Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us, and we'll see you guys then. Take care.